So am I on, Levi? I am now. Thanks so much. Welcome to Sunday morning worship here at Grace United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Christine Cunningham, and I just want to welcome each and every one of you to this morning's worship time. Let us now gather our hearts and minds into an attitude of worship as we hear this morning's prelude. Would you please join with me in this morning's call to worship? Let us gather in this place. In sincerity and faithfulness. And remember our ancient ancestors of the faith. Gather and declare whom we shall serve.
Let us join together in this morning's prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you let us choose between you and the false gods of this world. In the midst of the night of sin and death, wake us from our slumber and call us to yourself and your deep holiness so that we can follow you in all your ways. Amen. If our young people will come down, we'll have a few minutes here at the steps together. Good morning. How are you all today? So did school start for all of you this week? Yes, yes. So how did it go? Good. Good? You got one good. What about you all over here? It depends. It depends. What? Not so good? He doesn't like school. He doesn't like school. What about you, Libby? Did it go okay? Okay. Uh -huh. So it, that's just kind of the way it is, though. Sometimes it goes really good, and sometimes it's like, eh, I don't know. So it's a lot like work, you big people, you know? So we hate to say it, but you might need to get used to it. Some days are better than others, right? And so, oh, I'm getting feedback this morning. So, okay, I got two bags here. Where's this bag from? Target. Target. Everybody, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Because it's got what on it? Target. A Target, yeah. So where's this one from? Walmart. This, Walmart. Walmart. So, which one of these is better? If you had to choose where to shop, which one would you choose? What do you think, Amelia? Where would you choose, Target or Walmart? Walmart. Walmart. Why? Well, we have one in town. That makes a difference, doesn't it? You have to go a long way to get to a Target from here. What about you, Libby? Where, Walmart? Jonathan? Walmart? Target. 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 Why would you shop at Target? Because they have more things. They have more things, and what did you say? More toys. More toys. It's not just that they have more stuff, they have more toys, more interesting things for you. So, in the end, does it really make a difference where, which one of these stores you shop at? No, no. Not really. But you know what? We're going to be hearing a story today about a man named Joshua. And he is telling the Israelite people, God's people, it matters. You need to choose. You need to choose which God you're going to serve. And we need to choose too. And that makes a big difference. It doesn't really matter where we shop, Target or Walmart. We can usually get the toys I like, particularly Amazon. Because you can get just about every toy at Amazon, right? So, or eBay. Or eBay. There you go. Lots of places to shop right now. It's, but where we shop doesn't really matter in the scheme of things. But which God we worship and we serve, that makes a difference. It makes a difference in our lives and it makes a difference in the world. And so, we're going to be praying about that, but we're also, yeah, Jonathan. You can also get a big toy at a car dealership. You can get a big toy at that the car. car dealership, that car. So how many of you out there have gotten that big toy at the car dealership? Raise your hand. Be honest. Yes, yes. Absolutely. He is smart. So, um, Today we're also celebrating the starting of, more widely, our Sunday School Department. And so that's for adults and youth and for young people, and the nursery is open today. And so it's an exciting time in our congregation. So I would like for us to have our Sunday School teachers stand, please. Where are you? There they are. Look at all those Sunday school teachers. Yes. So they're the ones who are teaching. Stay standing. I'm sorry. Some of you are older. It might be hard. But um, 
If you've ever taught Sunday school, no matter the age or where you were, would you please stand? Look at all of those people. Look at them. Let's give them a round of applause. So they teach us about the God who we're called to serve. So let us pray over them. Let's pr give them a blessing. Almighty God, we just ask that you bless every Sunday school teacher here, both past and present and future. Lord, bless them with your wisdom and a commitment to teaching those of us who come along behind them to learn of you and to live by your rules. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. And thank you for your dedication to teaching uh, God's people. Let us go back to our seats, and thank you so much for joining me today. Would you please join me in today's prayer of illumination? God, you are our hiding place and shield. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Uphold us according to your promises that we may live, for we hope in your word. Amen. Today's scripture passage from the Bible comes to us from the book of Joshua, the last chapter, chapter 24. But before I read it, I want to give you just a little bit of background um, to help you maybe understand the passage just a little bit better. So in the time of Joshua, in the passage, he's going to be talking about other gods. And uh, it may help you to know that during that time period, basically every geographical area had its own panoply, its own group, its own horde of gods. And so when you move from place to place, like you lived here in Salem, you would worship a certain group of gods that were important here. And then if you moved over to Centralia, it'd probably be a whole different group of gods. But, you know, you might have really liked the gods in Salem, and, you know, you want them to continue to bless you, and so you just maybe take a couple of those with you because they were wooden and they were stone, they were maybe metal, and you would actually have a little statue of those gods, and you would sacrifice to those gods. And so, But you didn't want to make the ones over in Centralia mad by not worshiping them, so you would do the same for them. And so, um, needless to say, if you moved around at all, you might end up with a whole gob of gods. And... Uh, you might spend your whole time just worshiping them. Yahweh God is different. Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, is one that goes with you everywhere. And this God is a jealous God. This God does not want you worshiping all of those other gods because the understanding is they can do nothing. And so we have the passage from Joshua. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all of the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, they lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Now, therefore, revere the Lord. Now, I should say there's a, a gap in the lectionary lesson during which Joshua has enumerated everything that Yahweh God has done for them. And he says, now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. 
But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. So decision fatigue, have you been feeling it? Mental health experts are talking about it, and most of us are having to deal with it. It's that fatigue, anxiety, and brain fog you are experiencing when you're confronted with lots of decisions that need to be made, especially when they really matter. They have the potential for serious repercussions. The mental health experts are talking about it because they are seeing it more and more among us. More during these days because so many of our everyday decisions, our seemingly simple decisions, have become so much more consequential in the last 18 months. Decisions like Well, are we going to go out to eat or not, and where? Are we going to church or are we not, and is it safe? We're worried about enrolling our kids in school, and we have to make decisions about what to send with them. Can we go to the movies? Can we visit family and friends safely? These days, such seemingly simple decisions carry a lot more weight than they once did. And most of us, whether we're aware of it or not, are feeling the burden. So one way that I battled decision fatigue, I did this long before COVID ever came, was I shop at Aldi's. You know why? Because they have three varieties of apples instead of ten for me to choose from. (laughs) They have two brands of soup for me to choose from rather than eight takes a burden off of my small mind and my brain to not to have so many options to choose from. Now, groceries are one thing, but there are much more consequential decisions that have to be made in life, aren't there? And the Israelites are faced with one of those in today's scripture passage. Chapter 24 is at the end of the book of Joshua. Moses dies before the Israelites enter the promised land. And Joshua was the man that God chose to lead those people into the land and to fight the inhabitants for it because there were already people there. Joshua has done his work and he's near death himself when he summons the people to Shechem. As they are just preparing to enter into and take full possession of the land that they've fought so hard for. Having the people gather at Shechem has its symbolic and historical meaning for them. Symbolism that Joshua knows will be floating around in the very air around them as he speaks to them God's words. This is the place where Jacob, their long-gone ancestor, buried his own household gods as he built an altar to worship Yahweh and forged a covenant to serve only him. It is also here that their ancestor Joseph, you remember Joseph of the coat of many colors and he saved his people from the famine, but they ended up in... Egypt enslaved. Do you remember that, Joseph? So his bones are buried at Shechem, but he had left uh, a legacy behind saying, 
wherever the people went, they were to take his bones with them. And so as they enter into the promised land, they will take up his bones, gather them to their bosom, and move them with them into that promised land. It's in this memory-rich place that Joshua reminds the people about all that God has done for them. And then, then he places before them a moment of decision. He demands that they decide this day whom they will serve. And Joshua's demand, God's demand, echoes down to us even today. Choose this day whom you will serve. Now, I have found that choosing is not always an easy thing to do. I can't even decide on the type of apples I want to get. Because, you see, when we choose something, we are not only saying yes to the thing we're choosing, but in that very same moment, we're having to say no to at least one other thing and many times several other things. Some of those options may be bad or negative, so I don't know about you, but if it's a bad or negative option, I'm pretty good at bypassing that. But have you noticed, have you just noticed that a lot of times in life, the options are all good, and then you have to choose. Sometimes we have to choose the best from the good, and that's sometimes really difficult. Mother Teresa of Calcutta's birthday would be this week if she were still living. And she knew about these kinds of choices. She herself, as a nun, was teaching children in India. Certainly a worthy vocation. But she began to feel a deep compassion for the poor and the sick she encountered in the streets of that sprawling city. And she tells a story that one day she was riding on a train when she heard what she from then on called a divine summons. And it instructed her that she was to leave teaching in the convent where she was living and help the poor while living among them. Since her death, it has come to light through private letters and her diaries and papers that despite the success of her work, she often felt alone and desolate and had a sense of God's absence in her life. It would seem that even when we choose well, when our work bears wonderful fruit, when we are being faithful, we may not always feel fulfilled and close to God. Making the choosing even more difficult is the era in which we live. Our society tries to sell us the myth that we don't have to choose. We can do everything. We can have it all. We can be it all to everyone. And if we don't, there's surely something wrong with us. There's something wrong with the way that we're living, or the friends that we've chosen, or most ubiquitous, most present among us, is about what you are or are not buying. And many of us actually get indignant when the world doesn't deliver on this unrealistic myth. We think that the world owes us something. We feel entitled. We take a lot for granted. Much of our choosing may seem to have very little consequence day by day, but sometimes, it can have huge ramifications. Over the last several days, we've been seeing the outcome of the choosing by people in power 
as U.S. troops leave Afghanistan. The choosing of the various parties involved in that part of the world is impacting the land, the culture, families, individual lives, and the very hearts of those involved and far beyond those actually in that place. A pastor I know told me this week, too, about his father's decision to become a Christian way back in 1941. That one decision has borne fruit not only in his father's life, but in his life and in two successive generations since. We often fool ourselves into thinking that our choices really only impact us, maybe our circle of family and friends. But we don't live in a vacuum. Our choices have ripple effects. Some we can anticipate, and some we will never know. Joshua knows this as he presents God's demand. And God knows, Joshua knows, his people well. He's been living with them, working with them, crying with them, exalting with them for years. He knows they, like us, are a fickle people. He knows that in this moment in which they are hearing the wondrous acts of God on their behalf, their hearts are full and swelling with the dedication and commitment to the Lord. He knows they want to be faithful. Well, sort of, they want to. They want to as long as it doesn't inconvenience them, as long as it's easy, as long as it's comfortable, as long as they can feel secure in the midst of it. But remember, I told you, this Yahweh God is different than their regular household gods. Yahweh, through Joshua, is demanding they give up all those other gods. Yahweh is a jealous God. Not only does this God demand you give up all other gods, but also demands all of your life. But as Wilbur Reese has written, most of us would like to just buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode our souls or disturb our sleep but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or to snooze in the sunshine. We don't want enough of God to make us love a black man or pick beets in the field with a migrant. We want ecstasy, not transformation. We want the warmth of the womb, but not a new birth. We want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. We would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Joshua knows that the cost of revering and serving this God is more than a $3 investment. It is the pearl of great price, the pearl for which you have to sell everything else. Joshua knows the truth of the matter. The Israelites are not going to be able or willing to give up their God. The ones they have hidden under their beds or placed in the niche in the kitchen or buried in their field. And we as God's children today still struggle to give up our gods of leisure and family and money and power and knowledge and busyness, just to name a few. Notice, too, that Joshua doesn't just urge the Israelites to recognize Yahweh as one God among many, but rather this God is singular. Neither does he urge them just to give 
intellectual assent to God's existence and power. Joshua tells them to revere and serve Yahweh. Now, these two words in the Hebrew language are full of nuance and depth that don't get conveyed into the English. The word translated revere not only means to admire deeply, but to fear and to dread, to be in awe of. The word serve is even more deeply challenging as it means to be bound to, enslaved by, to make or execute something, to be a laborer, a tiller of the soil, a husbandman to animals, and a worshiper. When Joshua uses these two words in the pattern he does, it signals to the people that they are going to be entering into a covenant, a legal binding contract with Yahweh if they choose to serve him. Like us, the Israelites that day likely wanted to believe that Yahweh is a good and gracious God who loves them. But Joshua tells the people that Yahweh is also moral and holy, righteous and pure, and that he asks something of them in return. And what is expected is singleness of heart and mind and life on their part. Likely their enthusiasm, like mine, probably became faint and waned in the face of that. Despite their vow and covenant to God, Joshua knows they will not be able to keep their side of the deal. Joshua knows that the call of God for each of us is to be changed, to have a changed life, and that God is bidding us to come to him, to embrace him, all of him, with all of ourselves, with all of who we are. And we know that through the life of Christ, that once we have embraced God in this way, we are commanded to go and be an agent of change in the world so that God's kingdom might come on earth. But likely, we would prefer $3 worth of God instead. So thank heaven. Thank heaven for God's grace and mercy and forgiveness because we can't do this. We simply can't do it. And yet, God comes and embraces us, and when we can't do it, there is space for forgiveness and picking up and beginning again. In today's passage, Joshua doesn't denigrate the other gods whom they might choose to follow. This day that they are in, is about choosing, about choosing, as opposed to hemming and hawing. It seems to me many of us in the church have spent a long time hemming and hawing. I do it myself. We serve a mashup of gods that surround us. And my observation is, is that when we do this, our service to God takes a back seat to our service of all the other gods that we choose to serve. Many times in the church, we may have an obligation. We may have signed up to do something, and something better comes along. We excuse ourselves from what we've committed to at the church or to God. Our churches and our communities and the world have suffered because of our lukewarmness, our non-singleness of heart. And so today, it is again a good time for God's people to choose this day whom we shall serve. 
and to not only choose, because sometimes we choose all we want, we choose, but we never act. So today is not only a day for choosing, but beginning to act, to start serving. For let me tell you, the world needs us and needs the Lord our God. And that God is counting on you and counting on me. So let us not delay. you please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, after hearing the word of God read and proclaimed, we come to a time of response, of responding to what we've heard this day. And one of the ways that we can do that is through offering our financial gifts. But I would urge you as you give your financial gifts, that you also be about offering up your life to God. Before we hear this morning's offertory and you bring your financial gifts forward either here or at these back sections right here, um, let us hear these words. Daniel Webster is quoted as saying, the most important thought that ever occupied my mind was that of my individual responsibility to God. That is an important aspect of our lives as Christian stewards. Daniel Webster has helped us see how important it is. Today, ask about your individual responsibility to God and how important it has been to you.
Almighty God, we give you thanks for all that you have poured out upon us. And Lord, we ask that you would receive these gifts, these gifts that we have given from our lives. Take them and use them. Use us to bring about your kingdom here on earth. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Would you please join with me in this morning's affirmation of faith? We believe it has been the Lord our God who has freed both our ancestors and us. We believe it is God's love that has brought us out of the world's houses of slavery and sin and death. We believe God has done great signs in our sight. We believe God has protected us along our many ways. We choose to serve the Lord, for he is our God. Thanks be to God. Let's sing together. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a i 
eyes on you. starting Sunday school and uh, for those of you who may have elementary children those young people all of them in one group will be meeting in Grace Hall so they won't be in the Sunday school classes uh, in the education wing this morning so just so you kind of know where they will be again uh, the nursery will be open for uh, younger people our littlest ones uh, during the Sunday school hour as well for adults who may be going to a Sunday school class and um, John, Raymer, and Larry, where are your classes meeting? In their usual places? Yes. In their usual places. And I understand everybody else, you're meeting where you normally do. Now, you all know that, where those places are. I do not. So, <laughs> yeah, don't come to me if you're looking, because I don't know. So, I'll take you somewhere, maybe on a ride. So, uh, also, Bell Choir and uh, Sanctuary Choir are starting this week on the 25th on Wednesday evening starting at 5. See Jeannie. All of you flock to Jeannie. She would love to talk to you about that. And um, we just want to thank all of you for coming and worshiping with us today and so now receive this blessing. Dearly beloved of God, choose this day whom you shall serve. Choose wisely. Choose carefully because it makes a difference. Go in peace. Amen.